how is post colonial poetry relevant in india in this insanely diverse multicultural democracy how do we retain individualism and at the same time be a part of a greater tradition let us explore together small town and rivers a poem by mamang dai echoing the beautiful paradisal hills of arunachal pradesh if you like our content then don't forget to subscribe and stay connected with us on nibble pop normally we have in our syllabus some of the poems which are written by poets who belong to states of northeast india and often we tend to bring them together as northeast poets but how far is this right how far is this justified while studying mamang dai we will first try to look into her life a little bit and then into the ways in which she is trying to negotiate with the different forms available to her and the tradition that she is a part of now mamang dai was born on 23rd february 1957 and it was at pasigat it's the place in arunachal pradesh her family belongs to the adi tribe now the meaning the literal meaning of this word is hill or mountain the people who belong to this tribe they are nature worshipers they have these gods and goddesses derived from different forces of nature and it is very natural because when you are living in these places like arunachal pradesh and you are surrounded with such beautiful powerful images of nature around you then of course you would feel that these are the places where divinity resides so we have these people who believe in nature as god or goddess with mamang dai we have a strange kind of career movement she completed her graduation in english and then she moved on to become an ias officer in 1979 she was selected as an ias officer but she left that career to devote full time to journalism and of course writing poetry when she started writing she wrote mostly about her emotions her self her feelings but as she moved on to greater themes and larger issues she started to focus on how these close knit communities deal with everyday life and how tradition flows through generations in them one more thing that you have to remember about arunachal pradesh is that it's located at a position where there are certain political tensions because well it's not fun being a border state all the time when there are so many immigrants rushing into your own territories and there is always this constant tension between the center and the state so keeping these things at the back of our mind let's move on to the poem itself small towns always remind me of death my hometown lies calmly amidst the trees it is always the same in summer or winter with the dust flying or the wind howling down the gorge it's a very simple uh, straightforward beginning we have with a very peculiar morbid uh, meaning small towns always remind me of death now so far as immediate context is concerned uh, she is rather talking about her mother's younger sister who had passed away and this was a very personal loss for them and her body was being brought home it was a sad gathering and everybody was weeping and that moment kind of lived on with her and she echoes that moment in this line but in a larger context it is about the kind of life that people from small towns have death is always a more immediate reality there and especially if the place is full of possibility of political crisis my hometown lies calmly amidst the trees since mamang dai was born at pashighat she is referring to that town but this can refer to any town any small town in any hilly region in india it is always the same this is the key word same so the unchangeability the monotony the boredom and at the same time the predictability of small towns is 
what makes it different from big cities. In summer or winter with the dust flying or the wind howling down the gorge, now this personification of wind uh, where we can actually visualize the wind uh, rushing in like a monster, this whole thing creates an image of uh, little human efforts because what are towns? People build towns to shield themselves from these forces of nature. But here in places like Arunachal Pradesh, you simply cannot escape the howling wind. Now, when you also look at this word same uh, from the perspective of say the romantic poets like Wordsworth and Coleridge, then the permanence of nature that people like Mamang Dai, they witness regular basis, that permanence gives a kind of comfort. So what is this poem uh, giving you in the very beginning? Is it giving you a kind of morbidity uh, by talking about death or is it giving a kind of calm? Now it's a normal tendency in us to consider death and calmness as two opposed things, but aren't they very closely related to each other? Like what is death if not final calmness? So this is where we see a kind of gelling of two apparently opposite things in a very coherent way. That is, there is death and there is calmness in small town, unlike cities where you have lots of sound and fury signifying nothing. Just the other day someone died. Look at the way she is referring to this death. She is not giving you any particular name or even any particular date because it is such a regular thing, people dying all the time, that there is no point actually mentioning any one single incident. In the dreadful silence, we wept, looking at the sad wreath of tube roses, life and death, life and death, only the rituals are permanent. Now, human life is not a permanent thing. Human beings are mortals. What is permanent then? Mamang Dai looks at her tradition. She feels that the traditions remain through the generations intact and unbroken. And this permanence of ritual is very important because human beings survive through their next generations, through their children, through their grandchildren. How? By continuing the family traditions, the societal traditions, the village traditions. I also want you to look at this expression, sad wreath of tube roses. Wreath means uh, the flowers which are offered to a dead person. And when you offer that, you are sad. But is the flower sad? The flower is not sad. So this expression, sad wreath of tube roses, actually means that the person who is offering that wreath is sad. And this is called transferred epithet. You can also say it's pathetic fallacy because tube roses can't actually feel something. But here the poet imagines them to be sad. So this stanza tells us that man needs to continue their existence through rituals because otherwise life, especially because it's a mortal impermanent thing it means nothing the river has a soul in the summer it cuts through the land like a torrent of grief sometimes sometimes i think it holds its breath seeking a land of fish and stars the river has a soul she continues to the next stanza so it's a kind of a flow which maybe reflects the way the river flows and when she is talking about these natural objects, she is seeing them uh, like Wordsworth would have, infused with life, infused with a kind of consciousness that human beings possess. So there is this constant personification that we find here. And when you look at the expression, it cuts through the land. Um, cutting means a kind of hurting, wounding, and therefore it's linked to grief. But when rivers do that, they cut through the land, what are they actually doing? They are actually bringing in life, vitality. So see, again, you have these contrary ideas put together. 
and what is the river doing the river is holding its breath it's anticipating a final union with the sea where it will meet the land of stars and fish and everything the river has a soul it knows stretching past the town from the first drop of rain to dry earth and mist on the mountain tops the river knows the immortality of water the permanence of nature we all know about the water cycle right it goes right up from the sea uh, to the sky becomes clouds comes rain falls down reaches these rivers and then finally reach the sea so there is this water cycle nature is all about cycle you have oxygen cycle you have the nitrogen cycle what is cycle cycle means it gives you a kind of a security that everything that is dead will be alive again so this is very much an indian sentiment which believes in this karmic wheel that everything comes down to the first moment again you are always given a second chance and here nature is powerful because nature maintains its cycle and that gives it the permanence and what gives human beings permanence according to mamangdai the rituals which connect one generation to another when she is using the word water from a different perspective you might also say that every water droplet which reaches the river through the rain eventually reaches the sea but although this one water droplet makes one journey the river continues forever so the river gives a kind of permanence to the water which it carries through it a shrine of happy pictures marks the days of childhood this is almost worse word there in the evocation of childhood or memories as source of sustenance so she's also doing that small towns grow with anxiety for the future what kind of future what future uh, do people of arunachal pradesh hope to have now the problem in india is uh, not the diversity of india but the distance of certain states from the center and that becomes a problem because uh, well some of the states in northeast india uh, they receive uh, far less attention let's face it uh, mainly because you know there is less access of roads and there are these natural calamities uh, a language barrier at times cultural barrier at times so these are the problems which people of these remote states face all the time people from calcutta wouldn't understand this but i'm sure uh, many of us have been uh, on trips to sikkim and these northeast territories and we see how these people live in extreme hardship and at the same time they retain their cheerfulness because they're so close to nature the dead are placed pointing west when the soul rises it will walk into the golden east into the house of the sun now when you are lying down pointing towards west it means that you have reached the sunset of your life and your soul will rise up just like that water cycle you are participating in a spiritual cycle and your soul will rise up to meet the eastern sun all right so west here represents death represents end represents sunset whereas rising sun east represents a new beginning and people because they do not have much hope for this life they know that conditions won't change they know that things don't change in small towns they can only hope for a renewal through death so see death is not that scary for them sadly in the cool bamboo restored in sunlight life matters like this in small towns by the river we all want to walk with the gods in voice of the mountain mamangdai writes i just want to quote her from there in the end the universe yields nothing except a dream of permanence peace is a falsity a moment of rest
comes after long combat which means that you can only dream to become permanent you can only dream to participate in that cycle of nature but since human beings are finally mortal beings we do not know if that participation is actually possible when she says we all want to walk with the gods she is referring to these divine figures these gods of nature so by participating in the cycle of life and by believing that after death you can become a part of the greater cycle she is trying to connect the present mortality to this hope of immortality now this is very very common in poets to seek immortality and in mamangdai we really have a lot of echoes from wordsworth i don't know maybe she was a student of literature and uh, she was quite influenced by these romantic poets it seems we all are aren't we structure and style is of course irregular you do not have regular stanza there are the short stanzas long stanzas the meter is irregular regular line length irregular structure as a poem when you look at a river in say south bengal when it is very close to the sea you have a very steady movement but when you look at the same river when it's originating in the hills you see all zigzag patterns you can't see any consistency in the flow in the movement in the turns so when you have a poet writing from the same hills from where these rivers originate you will have the same kind of movement so her lines they reflect the way rivers move in hilly areas one more thing when we look at poems we expect it to have everything regularized we expect a regular meter we expect a regular stanza why because it's written and when anything is written down in front of us we try to see it not just as text but as picture so something which looks equal looks good but when we are speaking to people in oral narratives then this visual component goes away it's only what we hear and there in oral narratives it becomes more effective if the stanzas are not regular then they add to the effect what mamangda is doing here is she is writing a poem yes but she is writing it as if she is participating in this whole culture of oral narratives why because that is part of her own culture so this is written literature shaped as oral narrative i would rather quote from among thy herself i am influenced by the oral narratives knowing the stories gives me a sense of identity it inspires my writing she wants to say that these stories that are passed from one generation to another through these oral narratives they not just contain any incidents or historic accounts but rather symbols and they signify something far more important than what history books tell us and how how does she achieve this this oral narrative pattern uh, well one thing is she uses a lot of enchantment allowing flow of conversational speech you know almost like this river meandering through the valley so she flows from one line to another uh, without stopping at the end and that's enjambment and there is a chant like quality as if she is reciting a mantra you know life and death life and death uh, again into the golden east into the house of sun so this repetitive uh, almost mantra like chants they also add to the effect of uh oral narratives she uses this refrain small towns and rivers uh, alteration of course you have a lot of alteration here and we also have slanting rhyme half rhyme you know with the dust flying or the wind howling so you don't have proper rhyme scheme here but imitating the way oral narratives are delivered she is using these different experimental rhymes in her poems
So what do we get at the end of it? Do we get a poem belonging to the Northeast region? Mamangdai would be furious if you said this in front of her. The moment you use the expression Northeast literature, you are making it sound homogeneous, as if everything is um, you know, packed into one thing. And that's a misnomer. And she actually gets pretty angry and says somewhere, I have never heard terms like Northwest or Southeast or West Coast literature to define literature from other parts of the country. And she really, really feels that um, literature from the Northeast is as diverse as the writers with their different expressions and literature is literature. So you cannot uh, segregate a chunk of writings based on their uh, regional affiliation because that will mean that you are trying to be very condescending oh you belong to northeast literature and well i will treat you in a certain manner and i will treat say salman rushdie in a different manner but literature is literature so if post-colonialism is about validating multiplicity of voices grouping together a cluster of states is it's actually a regressive way of dealing with literature of a region. Post-colonialism as well as post-modernism is about breakdown of these clusters, these structures, this categorization. It's about celebrating individuality. How far has Pamangdai succeeded? I leave you with this question. Stay in touch. Stay subscribed. This is Mona Mukherjee signing off. Till our next video, stay happy, stay safe. Bye-bye.